Okay, the book that I, if you want to get it and, and you do speak regularly and you've never read it is Andy Stanley's Communicating for a Change. Andy Stanley, uh, I like him a lot. Uh, I like him a lot. Um, he's a really sharp guy. I don't know if he knows what he did here. <laughs> he might, but I, I don't know, because he never openly says it. But <clears throat> this book, the reason I'm recommending it to you, and I want to show you the me, we, God, you, we process, is because this is a form of narrative preaching. It is completely consistent with story, and he never says that, so I don't know what he knows about it. But he's a sharp guy. I'm going to assume he knows, but if he doesn't, it's still brilliant, <laughs> whether he did or not. Um, but here's what I know he does know. Most preaching is conceptual. And it's conceptual in the sense that we use an outline, right? So the way we were all taught to preach, unless you've really gone to school recently, is we were all taught to kind of get a, a, a um, summary statement of the text and maybe try to make that into some kind of a, this is like past tense, what happened. And, and I still do this work. I mean, I showed you how to do summary statement from a story. And get a big idea, and then you have your points about each idea, and under each one of these you have, applica uh, you have explanation, illustration, application, correlation, development, all this stuff, and you occasionally throw a story in there, but the sermon goes down like that. It's an outline. It goes down. Okay. Just one of the many problems with that <laughs> is, and a lot of, golly, I mean, people have been preaching like this forever. Larry, you probably preach like this, so don't take this personally. I, ain't, I, I have preached, okay, I've preached like this a lot of my life, and God has done amazing things with this kind of preaching. However, if you go back and remember the continuum, right? And I think I have written that in the correct place. That kind of preaching is likely to be more successful on this end of the board, not even here. These are our ESPN guys. They got a college education, but they're watching ESPN, okay? These folks over here, likely to have a better shot at that. But the people down here on this end of the continuum, forget it. Ships in the night. Forget it. And so, since 80% of America is on this side of the continuum, and these people, 50%, illiterate, functionally illiterate, have to have story to communicate, to get the information and to hang on to it, they have to have it in a story. The semi-literate need, really need it in a story. They will get some things with conceptual talk, but not so much. That means, and, and everybody prefers a story. They have to have it. We all prefer a story. And so vertical preaching, that isn't the way life happens. Life doesn't happen vertically. Life happens horizontally, right? Stories happen horizontally. And <clears throat> that's why life and story are such a good match, and that's why story is the key to relationship, because that's how life happens. Okay, so the, the big problem in, in terms of communication, and by communication what I mean is, I attempted to say something to you, and I effectively did it. You got it, and you decided to do something with it, right? Okay, I want to give, given the continuum and where most of America is, and given the idea that I want to resurrect from the first day, that it's our job to use communication as a means to serve people, all right? Not just to pass on what we know, but to serve their needs I want to propose that since most of America doesn't live or think this way very well, that we need to change our approach to communication that gives them a better chance of connecting. Now, there are three, <clears throat> three basic definitions of preaching. One, one definition of preaching is to teach 
the Bible. The second is to teach people the Bible. And those are not the same. Do you know the difference? No. Okay. Uh, teaching the Bible means here is what the Word of God means, here's what it says, here's what it means, and you need to do this. Okay? My primary concern is that you understand the Scriptures. And if you understand the Scriptures, then you'll get it. And, there, and so much the better. Okay. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have sat under a really good Bible teacher and they take this thing apart and you say, wow. Okay, here's the problem. Most of us are not that. Most of us aren't that good. So if, if a teacher has an incredible gift to take apart the scriptures in a way that other people understand it, go for it. Most people don't have that ability. That's not the only problem with it, but it is one problem with that. However, if you can effectively teach the Bible, God's going to do a lot of good things with it, okay? So I'm not trashing this. It's just not the one I'm going for, given the continuum. Teaching people the Bible means that my first concern is to teach the people, and I'm going to use the Bible to do that. And so in this... I'm concerned to do application with you, but I'm still teaching you the Bible itself. And, you know, I know a, bun a bunch of you got to be sitting there right now saying, and Witty, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it except that we've got this continuum that we're laying over this thing, okay? These, both of these are vertical approaches and both of them tend to rely heavy, heavily on literacy. And you can see the disconnect that that's going to have with about 80% of the population. They're going to get some of it, but you know what they're normally going to remember from this, this guy right here? They're going to remember his illustrations, the stories he told, and things like that. Yeah. Would it be uh, fair to say that teaching the Bible is more of an analytical approach and teaching people is more of a heart approach? Yeah, uh, you, could, you could make that statement. Um, the focus here, you're still teaching the, the Bible, but you're teaching it to people, and you have a concern that people get it and do something with it. Up here, I really just want you to understand. Here, I, I want you to feel it and maybe, you know, maybe do something with it. I'm going to suggest some things. Yeah, and, it, and so this is better. I think this is better than this in terms of helping people, and I think it connects with more people here. But I still think these, both these approaches have typically been taught conceptually in outline forms, vertical preaching. The third definition, the one that I'm going to show you, is talking to people about their lives through the lens of Scripture. Yeah, when I'm teaching you the Bible, I'm starting here and working my way out to you. When I'm talking to you about your life through the lens of Scripture, I'm starting and ending with you through the lens. I'm, I'm filtering our lives through the authoritative Word of God. Now remember, nothing has changed since Monday. I am still a what? I'm a fundamentalist. I still am. <clears throat> so that has not changed. I, I haven't changed my view of Scripture at all. What I have changed is the purpose of my 25 minutes on the weekend. That's what I've changed. Because these are both primarily have to do with what you know. I want you to know something. This, I want you to do something. I want you to change. I want you to do something differently. If we use the analogy of eating, do you work out so you can eat, or do you eat so you can work out? <laughs> Big difference. Big difference. 
That's, that's the question. What do you do? Do you work out so that you can eat more? Or do you eat so you can work out? Because if you, one is very different than the other. At the end of working out so you can eat, when you get to be my age, you'll get to look pretty heavy. Whenever you eat to work out, you get the calories you need and the kind of calories you need to accomplish this goal and you burn them up and you stay pretty thin, okay? And you tend to be healthier, right? Okay, so what we're talking about here is the difference kind of between those two. When you know, and I just want to know more, know more, know more, know more, it's kind of like eating more, eating more, eating more, eating more, but I really not doing anything with it. That's not healthy for any of us, and we know that. And it, it can, there's something really good about that. Food is good. It's a blessing from God. Word of God is called what? Milk and? Honey. And honey, milk and? Bread. Bread, meat. I mean, there's all kinds of, so the scriptures are food for us. But they're designed so that we end up doing something. And this form of teaching, this form of preaching, this definition is talking to people about their lives. People that are far from God are really concerned about themselves. <laughs> oh, so are we. I mean, we are. Come on, we are. So, <clears throat> uh, it take, take any motive and use it for the gospel. But we're talking to people through the lens of Scripture. And so, the emphasis is in a different place, and what we want is we want people to change what they do in their lives, thus communicating for a change. Now, this has a double meaning, brilliant title. What, what, are, what could that title mean? Well, you've never communicated yet. Why don't you communicate for a change, <laughs> okay? Why don't you communicate for a change? Okay, it means that, but it also means communicating for a change in people's lives, okay? When this is your goal out here, now everything, you're working your way back to attain that. All right? So this is the definition that we're going with, is we want people to do something different. So when you start, when you've studied the scriptures, and I'm not going to talk to you about how to study the scriptures today, but once you've studied the scriptures, the question should be, what do I want to do differently? What should change? Right? We ask that question in our dialogue, right? Hey, what should change because we've heard this story? That's what we're after. What should change in us? And I would say don't ever decide what should change in them until you've decided what should change in you. And you don't know what should change in you until you've told your story so that the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to change you and to challenge you, right? Now you see how this works into our preaching? That's one way it works. So I get out here and I say, I want them to do this. Then I start building a story toward that that's going to promote that kind of change. And remember the other day we had production about right here on the board? Whenever you do a, an intentionally produced service, the reason you're doing it isn't just to be cool. It's to support the change that you want. Everything in the production is designed to heighten this experience so that people leave and they say, okay, I'm doing that. That's what you're trying to do. So every song, every video, it's not just so we can have song and video. It is that, but it's not just that. Everything you do, Rick, uh, this right here, and the way it's done is an attempt to communicate, right, and to connect with somebody in a way they understand so that they'll believe something different, so that they'll do something differently. It's, a, it's produced on purpose. When we don't produce our services on purpose, when our sermons don't have a point and an intention to end up at, then we're just sort of up there mucking around because it's my 30 minutes. <laughs> How many times have you guys, because I've done this, how many times have you walked into the pulpit and as you're preaching, you're trying to figure out what, in fact, you're saying? Oh. <laughs> okay, if, if you don't know what you're saying before you get up there, they don't either. We all know that, but I can't. I've done it. I've done it. And, and usually you know you did it when you found it really hard to land the plane. 
couldn't quite land it because you never knew where you were going to start with. Okay. Me, we, God, you, we. Okay. Let's go through this and then let's see if we could, let's see if we could maybe do a quick sermon. Page seven. Page, page seven. <clears throat> Talking about our lives through the lens of Scripture with the goal of changing the way we live. That's kind of our definition. All right, the purpose of the me section. The me section, okay. So you studied your story, okay? You studied your story. You got the climax here. You stated what it was in a past tense. Then you turned that into a question. You turned that statement into a question. And then you translated the question. You translated it into a modern question that is a burning question that all the people listening to you would love to have the answer to that question. All right? That's what I mean when I talk about translating it. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be really good. Okay, remember the first day we, we started trying to do this? What was wrong with your questions? Churchy. Too churchy. churchy. Okay, but it was way better than what you had before. But they were still too churchy. Everybody wasn't... Okay. Once I know what the passage is about, I have the summary statement, and it's dead on accurate. And you guys realize this is potentially hours of study to figure this out. And it's not just academics. It's prayer. It's the Spirit of God speaking to you. It's Him giving, leading you in study and giving you insight. And you can now say, this story is about this. And you're dead on. Right. And then you translate that into a modern, what does that mean today in ordinary language that people far from God use? Okay, once I have that, then I do some things in the me section. The first thing that I'm saying you do is identify with the people. That's right. I don't want that one first. Go down to authenticity. I want to ask the question, I'm going to put some new stuff on there. I... Okay, what is my struggle, my struggle, all right? What is my struggle with this? No, I'm saying, whatever this is in your story, what is my struggle with it? What's your struggle with it? That's the first thing, I, one of the first things I'm trying to do. God, what does this say to me? And where has that been in my life? Okay. So it's very personal. If you know your story, it's real easy to say, oh yeah, I know right where that goes to on me. When you don't know your story, you know what we often think? Uh, I don't need that, but I know somebody who does. Now, starts right here. I need that. And, here's, and here's, a, here's now a story from my life that wasn't that, perhaps, okay? Uh, a story from my life that kind of shows some of the tension, the tension that I have with this. In the me, we section, we're raising tension is what we're doing. Tension is a really good thing when you're communicating because it makes people want to listen to you. Okay? <clears throat> so, what's my struggle with that big idea? Uh, whenever, what does my story What's my story, and, and how does it relate to that big idea, this big question over here, all right? Now, for you guys who are older, Larry, for you that's preaching every week and you're older, one of the huge advantages of your life is you got a truckload of stories, a truckload. You should always have a killer opening in your talks if you do this. And people be sitting there and they're saying, God, I didn't. You said out of my story? Yes, okay. this is me. This is the me section. So it's you, the me section. Okay. And they're saying, I never knew that about Pastor Larry. Wow. Okay, you're not always going to look good in that section, you realize? Sometimes, but then they're going to say, dang. Can you believe Pastor Larry? He's, okay, I thought he was like perfect or something. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, well, just ask one of us, you know. <laughs> no? And, they, and what happens is, is they say, wow. Okay, now, over here, I'm not suggesting that you're like, oh, I was, you know, I'm not saying you give away too much here in the way you tell the story, but you got to give away enough that it's a good story to listen to, right? But that's what we're doing. What this does in the me section is it helps you identify with people. And it, it helps you identify with people, I believe, who are far from God. When the pastor begins to identify with people far from God, it changes the culture of the church. You will either get fired or your church will go with you and your church will begin to identify with people far from God. It depends on how, many, how much money you got in the bank. You got to make some withdrawals, right? But if you have money in the bank and you've been there and you begin to identify, I'm an ordinary guy, you don't tell things that you shouldn't tell, but you tell more than you might, you've ever told before. It's your story. And people begin to recognize that, that you're like them. You are human after all. Mm -hmm. Dwayne? When you said you shouldn't tell things that you shouldn't tell. Um, Let's see. I think one that. I've been tempted by a woman, but you don't go into details of how she did. Yeah, or like, say, uh, let me tell you one that I think is very, that I've told, I think it's easy, it's okay to tell. One of the things I discovered in my story is how often I put expectations on Linda that she couldn't fulfill. But Linda was phenomenal in that. And that, you know what, a bunch of you ladies out here, if you'd have been my wife, you'd have said, see you later, Jack. But Linda was gracious with me. She loved me. And she put up with that. I was wrong. She should not have had to do that. But that is who I was. Okay, you see what I just did? What did I just do? I, I might disclose more, but we're limited on time. But I did a couple of things there. Number one, I said, okay, this was a problem I had. I did this. <clears throat> Secondly, I said, Linda is awesome. And she is. I'm not pretending. She is. She's, she's put up with a lot of stuff a lot longer than she should have. And so all the women out there say, well, that's cool. <laughs> you know? And yeah, maybe I could put up with a little more. I don't know. And... And then, and then I admitted, and what I did was wrong. I was wrong. It is how I was, but I was wrong. But it also helps other people say, you know what, maybe some other men are sitting out there saying, okay, I'm just like Witty. And I always thought he was, you mean I can be a Christ follower and not be here? I can be a spiritual person who loves God and not always be there? Yeah, yeah, I think you can. And I want that to be a part of our culture. And so part of what I'm doing is I'm identifying. I'm doing more than that. I'm also setting up the rest of the story. But I'm letting people see me. Another thing that I'm doing is I'm raising tension from my struggle with the big idea of the story. That's what I just said. I got the big idea, and there's tension being raised. I'm raising more tension with the big idea. Tension with big idea. And then, uh, another thing I'm doing is I'm helping to create a culture of acceptance. It's, it's, it's okay to not be perfect around here. Do you know why a lot of people far from God, they just, okay, you guys think you're perfect and you're not. That's when they're calling us hypocrites. Or, I can't be like you guys. And so, I'm just not trying. I'm not coming. I don't think I can fit in. I, I can't live up to your standard. Okay, and it just, it's daunting, and they don't want to, they, they just not going to try. And then it helps me to be authentic. So, I raise a struggle like that out of my own life. I tell a story out of my own life. Now, especially when you go to speak to people who don't know you, you need to start with a personal story, because before you try to give them your message, they don't even know who you are. And so, especially in a new place 
where people don't know you very well, they need to hear some of who you are. This talk is not about you, but you are a part of it. And they're learning from your story and their story. They're going to weave a story together while they're listening to you. And so they, they, it helps people get to know you if you're a, a, you know, an only time, it's a one-off time, and it helps people be able to listen when you finally get to the God section. John, before you move to the weeds, I have a quick question. Yes. Is there ever a time people get tired of hearing about you and your story? Yes. And like if you've been there quite a while, you don't have to tell a story about yourself all the time. Or there are points, Mike, where you just tell little vignettes of different kinds of stories. And you might just use a little three-sentence vignette out of your life. You know, I remember a time whenever, uh, you know, Dad said this, and I did that, and man, did I get in trouble. That's enough. Okay, but you're in the, you're in the sermon, and, it, and they know that you've, you're there. But yeah, every week doesn't have to be a long you know, recitation about yourself. They, don't, they didn't come to hear about you, but when people say, okay, he's in this, he's in this thing too, it helps right. more than it hurts. No, I understand that. I just hit, was fearful. Yeah, you could get too much, but okay. Then, what I a, a transition is often. You know, I really struggle to this with this, or this has been a tension with me in the text. God says that you ought to pray without ceasing. Well, y'all, I can just tell you, I got some other things to do besides pray. <laughs> Am I the only one like that, or are any of you feeling like that? Do you ever, do you, you ever struggle, ever struggle with prayer? And they're all saying, yeah, I don't pray all the time. In fact, I, I hardly ever pray. You know, there's, there's a ton of reasons why. We kind of believe in prayer, don't we? We. Now it's all we stuff. We sort of believe in prayer, don't we? We pray when we're, when we're in trouble. You know, and we kind of, anybody ever do that? Like, oh no, it's coming now. And so then you start talking to your parents a lot to sort of make them like you. Like my 16-year-old son's talking to me all the time. Okay, what's going on? Okay, we use prayer that way sometimes, right? When we know we're in trouble and we kind of want to get close to God so maybe he won't hammer us. We use prayer that way. Or we pray just because it's a, it's a ritual, you know, that some of us were taught. And we think it's kind of magical. I'm thinking off the top of my head here, and prayer is not my best topic, because I really, it's not my best topic. And then maybe there's another, you know, there's another reason we pray. There's this thing called transactional religion. And transactional religion, we try to get as much from God, paying as little to God as we can. And so we just sort of kind of throw a prayer out there, you know, and Think, well, okay, if I put enough of those out there, maybe God will give me what I want. Okay. So now I'm coming up to my question. This is the big question that I know my story is going to answer, and I put it over right here, and it's my transitional sentence, and it's the big question. This is the question that everybody in the room if you're going to answer that question, I'd like to hear the rest of what you have to say. This has been pretty easy to listen to because it's been a story about you and it's been us talking about us. And we're all interested. That's easy listening. And people are sort of, yeah, I'm interested in that. And so then you put your big question out there and this should be a question that everybody in the room says, yeah, I'd like to know the answer to that. Okay, see? See what you've done? Now, in our storying setting, how did we do this? In, our, in what we just taught you. How did, where did we do this in our story setting? The very, at the beginning, right? You know, I remember this time. There was a, Ben came and he just, you know, you're going to take me on. And we had this fight in front of the friends. And, you know, are there just some challenges that you got to win? Oh. Well, what are those? What makes the list and what doesn't? Well, let me tell you. I, I want to, you know. Okay, and then we move into the God section. When the question is a question that everybody wants to know, 
Everybody wants to know, and they're listening. I mean, you got them. It is served up. Can you hit this one out of the park is kind of what that is. Also, if you're doing a production, you're, the whole goal of your production team is to help raise the question so that they have served it up so that all the pastor, preaching pastor has to do is, boom, knock it out of the park. And that's the, that's the role of production is to help set it up so that the Word of God is like, wow. And, you know, Hybels always used to say, you know, basically they ran it all the way down the five-yard line. All he has to do is kind of boom, and he's in. Okay, when you're using various types of media and things like that, that's what you're trying to accomplish. So, the big question. Then, what do you think, this, what do you think the God section is? If this is the big question, what is this? Yeah, this is the, this is the story, or... It's the verse, or it's the text, or whatever. Doesn't, this, is, this works whether it's a, a story that you started with or whether you just started with the epistles. This can work on anything. This turns any text into a story form of preaching. And so, if this is the question, then this is the answer. <laughs> if the question is clear, the answer doesn't have to be long. Okay? All you preachers that love to say, and this word means that, and oh, it, over here it's used this way, and did you know, and I found this, and they're yawning. <laughs> okay. No. Stop. Okay, what you got to do is you got to call your preacher buddy and say, all right, dude, I, I exegeted this passage, and I got to tell you what I, let's go eat lunch together, and just let me tell you all my word of God stuff. Because you're not going to tell all of that in your talk. Here's the way that I learned from Dave, my lifelong friend. Dave will come in here and say, you know, he raised this question. He say, you know, there is a, there's a story over in wherever in the Bible. And I just want us to look at a, at a few things out of that story and then we'll be done. And everybody's like, cool. <laughs> and yeah, by the way, I'm interested to know, like, we're getting on with this thing. And he'll come in and he'll say, Okay, text, you know, the scripture says here in this passage, or part of the story, uh-huh, part of the story, Jesus had been on a preaching tour in Galilee, and when he came home, uh, you know, he was, okay, whatever, and everybody was there at his house and stuff like that, and you, you get to that, and then, here's what you do. What's the point? Point. What is it? And you state it. So it's very brief. Here's the word of God. Here's the point. And then what do I do with that? What does that mean? And it's another statement. You know what? This means, for us, this means this. You see how you're moving through? And then you get to the next part of the story. Point. And here's what it means. And then occasionally in here, you need a little bit of illustration a little vignette, normally. I don't know how to spell vignette. I'm going to spell it like it sounds. I'm pretty sure that's not right. But a little vignette in there that illustrates the application so that people say, oh, that's what you mean. That's, that's what you're talking about. And then you move on to the next part of the text, and somewhere in there you should have your really good big idea. And your big idea is maybe it gets repeated every time in your point. Big idea. And then a little more text. And then big idea. A little more text and big idea. And they hear it over and over again. And if it's a really good statement, it begins to stick with them. 